And you're very welcome back to the Agriland Pavilion here at the National Ploughing Championships in Rathaniska in County Leash. Our live stream brought to you in association with UPMC this year on site. Next up here on the stage, I'm joined by somebody who might need no introduction to people here in the tent and watching at home. Of course, it's Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine with special responsibility for land use and biodiversity, Green Party Senator Pippa Hackett. Pippa, you're very welcome to the Agriland Pavilion. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. And look, I suppose, firstly, before we go any further, our, our sympathies on the, the passing of your Thank father you. very recently. And, you know, we, we just wanted to extend our sympathies first to you. And I suppose there's no point welcoming you to the National Ploughing Championships because you're on home turf at the moment. It might be a bit soft out there, but people are enjoying this. This is a very important part of the agricultural calendar. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you can see the crowds today. They're probably a little bit bigger than yesterday. The the weather wasn't great yesterday, but you know, 60 odd thousand people still turn up. Um, and once you're dressed for the weather and have the right gear on, I could have done with some wet weather gear on top of everything else yesterday, but uh, good, it's really um, enjoyable. I think it's great for people to, to meet old friends. And there's so much here, you know, it, is, it has really developed over the years. I remember coming, you know, over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. and it was always very much about the sort of machinery, but now there is everything, you know, from, from it, the whole livestock side, there's fashion shows, there's, there's cooking, there's, every sort of enterprise, it's, it's innovation. I mean, it's wonderful to see. And even, you know, even like stands like yourselves here, it's great to see. Yeah. And I suppose, look, they say that there's no such thing as bad weather, it's bad clothes. So Absolutely. yeah, we, we've all learned the hard way in the last 24 hours, that's for sure. Minister, we're going to start with organics because uh, just in the, the last few hours here at the site, you have launched a new organic online hub. Can you tell us what that's about? Yeah, this was an ask really that came from the sector itself and from farmers. Um, and it was really about sort of joining, I suppose, joining the dots in production from sort of the farm gate all the way through to, to the finished product. And I suppose that has been one of the challenges of organics that we've seen sort of leakage, as they call it, um, from organics into the conventional sector. Um, and that has an impact then on, on you know, what's available at, at the, the market end. But this, this organic trading hub, I suppose it, it's a little bit like a done deal but for organic farmers and for organic producers. And, and it's just launched today. It's already active. People can uh, log on to the, the site, organictradinghub.ie, and there, there'll be animals up there for sale. If you want to sell, if you want to buy some hay, go on there. If you want to sell your straw, go on there. And it's really about to create a bit of a, a marketplace for organic uh, products and produce. Mm -hmm. And look, I mean, the interest in organics is enormous for many, many different reasons. We've seen rising input costs and we often hear that many farmers are being very close to being organic yeah. you know it's just maybe the extra step maybe it's reducing or eliminating entirely chemical fertilizer use on farm I suppose the the organic farming scheme it's due to reopen again this year can you can you give us a date on when it's due to reopen because there might be farmers here who are interested in in conversion well look we don't have a, an official date yet we still have to finalize the, the budgetary requirements for, for next year on that but I mean last year it opened in, in around October maybe the middle of October I would think we'd be looking at the same sort of date and it probably stays open until maybe mid-December. So there's, there's plenty of time there. Um, you're right, there's been a lot of interest. I mean, it's certainly, um, you know, it's, it's certainly gone to the top of a lot of people's thoughts when they think about their farms, what they might do over the years ahead. Um, and uh, yeah, for a no number of reasons, as you say, the rising input costs is, is one element, but also it's, um, it's something that, you know, when we went into government, we wanted to see more of. It's certainly the direction of the European Green Deal wants to see more organic farming. And it's not just for the sake of organic farming, because it has the benefits in terms of the sustainability criteria, the improvements in water quality, biodiversity, and all those things we hear so much about nowadays. And it's just an option there. We have it out there. We've it well supported, well funded. Farmers get you know good supports if they want to. We can help them convert to, to organic farming. Um, and as I say, it's it's not for everyone. It might suit people's enterprises. It might suit their farms. But it is an option. And if anyone's anyway interested, there's plenty of advice here at the yeah. ploughing in the organic tent. Uh, organic, we'll organic, sorry, organic village. I'm, I'm, I'm demeaning well. it, yes. calling it a tent. It's yeah. a large, large venue. And um, you know, it's great to see that you know Chagas and yeah. the, uh, the ACA and the advisory services and Board Bia and, mm -hmm. and my own department and the farm orgs have got behind it. So it's really welcome. 
I suppose what I would say, though, when it comes to organics is there is huge interest. But when we saw when the last round of the scheme opened, it was, you know, farmers predominantly on the, the western seaboard. But when we look at the sectors, are we leaving dairy behind when it comes to organics? And we spoke about this because by coincidence, I interviewed you on the Agri Land stand last year as well, Minister. And we spoke about the issues with organic dairy. And since we've spoken about that, a, a group of organic suppliers have come together. They're enormously concerned. I mean, we have about 70 odd dairy farmers who are organic and maybe in or around 30 who are currently on conversion. But there's huge issues there. I mean, the cost of their inputs is very, very high. But the price they're being paid for their milk is static. They're not e eligible for any bonuses. Uh, how are we going to attract the dairy sector into organics? Or are, are we just primarily, is the government's focus maybe more on dry stuff? No, we really want to see all farmers come into organics and, and dairying, I mean, is, is a very important part of that. And as you say, the numbers are still low. I mean, in all honesty, we've come off a very strong dairy year last year. Prices in the conventional sector were very high and, and certainly were, you know, competing, if you like, with the organic price. But the organic price stays pretty stable over the years. If you look at the, the average price over the last 10 years, for example, it doesn't fluctuate to the same degree that the conventional price. But the feed but can, price fluctuates the, the feed quite significantly. Does, but I think yes. that's one of the uh, elements of if you are going to become an organic farmer, you have to think about all of those things. It's not literally, what do I replace? my feed with? What do I replace my, my inputs on my farm with? It's thinking about it a different way. What can I do on my farm that lowers my input costs? Now, I know a, a number of dairy farmers who who, who, who've only recently converted to, to uh, and, and people might be familiar with them on, on, on social media and so forth, but they, they made the, the, the changes on their farming systems many years before they went organic. They, they had essentially weaned themselves off fertilizer. They were growing high protein crops. Um, and, you know, they're replacing some of those high input things, whether it's fertilizer or feed, with, with, with crops they can grow themselves on their own farms. And that's the sort of mindset shift that you need. Uh, but um, what to can you do it. as the minister to, to help dairy well, farmers um, to convert to organic if they want? Well, because I mean, at the moment there is a problem in that sector. Well, I mean, even if you look at the supports we've put in place for things like multi-species swords, for red clover, all of that enables farmers to move off the, off the, the fertilizer uh, roundabout, if you like. You know, it, and, and we're not saying reseed your whole farm next year. You can try it field by field. You can assess it on your own land. You can see how your soil interacts with it, if, if it's working, if it's not. So, I mean, there are steps people can make now. They don't have to think about going organic, but you know, maybe if they do that for a number of years, they might find, actually, I'm coping really well here without those inputs. And in fact, they'll be saving money straight away, or, or I should spin that around, they'll be making more money straight away. Um, so what role do the processors have here? Because obviously, as I said, it's just a constant price that th these farmers are receiving. They can't you know, get bonuses where the conventional dairy farmer can, you know, it, how do they make it attractive well, and how can you encourage them to make it attractive? Well, I'd certainly, like, I mean, we know now that Borbia have really sort of, um, are, are really sort of pushing now the organic sector. They put in place a, a standalone organic manager to look at those markets. And the demands are strong for organic dairy produce, not just in Ireland, but across Europe. Mm -hmm. And it is about tapping into that. It is about accessing that and creating that demand. It is chicken and egg because people will say, well, I'm not going to go organic if the markets aren't there. The marketplace will say, well, if you can't supply me with a constant supply of, of product, there isn't a marketplace for it. So I suppose it's about trying to balance that. We've seen it in the beef and the, and the, the you know, sheep sector. Um, there is a good demand for beef. There is good demand for lamb. People think, oh, no, there isn't, but there actually is. And um, we've, I, I met quite recently with Irish Country Meats, and you know they could they could threefold the amount of lamb that they process. Mm -hmm. Some of the challenges are that having it a constant year round, but that's the same for every market. Organics yeah. is no different. And ultimately, at the end of the day, farmers can't affect change in the marketplace, whether yeah. it's conventional or, or organics. But what we do know is that consumers' attitudes are changing. Conscientious consumers are looking to, you know, looking to understand how their food was produced, where it was produced, and that yeah. organics certainly fits that bill. Before we leave organics, Minister, obviously the target is somewhere around 450,000 hectares, which will be about 10% mm -hmm. of the agricultural land in the country. To my knowledge, we're at about 2.5 as things stand. We're a little more now with the more recent additions, even okay. though they're not 
not fully converted yet, but right. we're probably up near around 4% already. Okay. That's coming off a base of about 1.6% when we entered government. So, there, yeah. there, you know, the strides are being made there. So, are you confident by 2030 we're going to hit that target? I think so. And, and, and potentially, I think, as the, as, as, as the critical mass of the sector grows, you, you, we might even surpass it. But I, I'm absolutely confident we will. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I suppose we're going to move on, um, Minister, because obviously forestry is another major part of your brief. And it is, I suppose, a part of your brief that you've come in for sharp, sharp criticism. Many people have called for your resignation on um, this issue on forestry. The licensing issue has been, you know, horrendous at times, you know, and, and we've spoken to so many people who are involved in forestry. The, the confidence in forestry is at an all time low. Um, we have a 1.3 billion euro forestry program now. But can you tell us where things stand at the moment? Because there seems to be uncertainty. We had the Cabinet approving the final version of this programme. But the EU Commission then subsequently giving us a drip feed in August of individual aspects of the programme that has, uh, it approved, has state aid approval. What's left now? Is there any other aspects of this programme that are left to be approved by the Commission? Can we kick on from here? Are we still waiting for a green light from the Commission? Because we seem to be a little bit in the dark on that. I might back up to the start of your question there. And when, when this government took over, when I took over my role as minister, we were faced with an absolute crisis in the sector. Not of this government's making, I might add. It was previous administrations had let things not, you know, hadn't dealt with things well. So we, when I started in my role, we had a massive backlog in the appeals process, which had caused, a, in part, caused the issues with the licensing. This was all due to um, an, an EU court case that was taken against Ireland in 2019, which caused us to have to change how we issued our licenses because we hadn't been doing them correctly. We hadn't been taking enough environmental considerations into play. Um, so I've worked really hard for the last three years to clear up all of that mess, to, to de develop a licensing system that is now fit for purpose, that turns around licenses in as quickly as possible time. It, you're not going to get a license in two or three months or four months. It's yeah. a long process. But the, the, there's no delay now in, in felling licenses. And I think we are a very exciting time now for forestry because we've cleared the decks of the dishes. Now yeah. to move on to the, the, where we're going from now, um, we did have a prolonged state aid approval process. We need um, approval from the EU even to spend our own money on forestry yes. from competition laws and things yeah. like that. Um, and we have been, we have been given the, the green light now. So really it's, it's, it's all go now in terms of um, a so forest application. The entire 1.3 billion approved? Is the that where we stand The entire 1.3 billion is approved, but the, the 340 odd million that we heard that was mentioned as the figure is for the next five years. The 1.3 yes. billion covers the 20 years of the whole programme. So if you plant mm -hmm. a tree today, as a farmer, you'll get 20 years premium, uh, yes. and that will cover that. So that's, that's what the allocation is for. OK, so I think that's where maybe the, the confusion yes, yeah, exists. One is for five years, the whole the 1.3 billion is for the whole programme. OK, and look, the afforestation scheme obviously is a, a huge part of this. We've seen very, very poor figures. You know, there, there was an interim measure. I know mm -hmm. there was the de minimis scheme to, to bridge that gap. But I mean, the, the figures are very, very poor, Minister. Like, or, I suppose our target is 8,000 hectares a year, and we're, we're running currently, I think, you know, well below even for this time last year, I think it was about 1,700 hectares. So, you know, we're, we've a, a lot of work to do here. Absolutely, there's a lot of work to, you're yeah. right, well, there is a lot of work to do. Um, and, and as you say, that confidence in the sector has been dented over the last number of years. Um, I think what we saw maybe even in the last year is that people knew a new programme would be coming and there's a sort of a natural tendency to back off and wait and see what the, the next programme will be. And we've seen that. We've, that's why Do you we think announced there's more it. to it than that, though? I mean, it, like that farmers really have lost confidence I think that, but in planting. I think there's a challenge, um, and there has been a challenge with forestry, maybe with the premiums weren't high enough, you know, to attract farmers in. And now that's we've them increased between 46 and 66 percent. So there's a massive increase in the, the financial supports for farmers. All of this is tax-free, of course, has been for a long time. Um, but confidence is one thing. I think challenge for land is another. You know, there are other land use pressures, particularly mm -hmm. from the likes of the dairy sector. And, and you know, there's a whole issue now there with banding and nitrates and so forth. Um, but just talking to people either here at the ploughing and previous shows like Tullamore Show and different, uh, talking to the people, uh, people in, in Chagas and, and the forestry companies, there is interest now. I think that the financial supports 
are making people say, oh, I might have a look at this. Yeah. Um, and the variety of what we're proposing now for farmers, I mean, even, even the, the non-licensed one hectare native woodland scheme is, yeah. is attractive to farmers. It's not a massive area of land. Yes. It helps us in our figures, but it helps also farmers to maybe take that first step into forestry, because the vast yeah. majority of farmers don't have forestry on their farms. And, and I think it also deals with maybe that accusation of maybe commercial forestry being a monoculture, yes. you know, and, and everything like that. But I suppose, Minister, to come back to the point, you know, as I said, people have called for your resignation over this. Um, Michael Lee Ray's accused you of being asleep at the wheel on this issue. Well, what's your reaction to that? I just think they're, they're, they're not keeping up with what's happening or not even trying to understand the processes. I mean, there was criticisms about how long the state aid a, a process was taking, for example, to get the approval. Um, that was really in the in the lap of the the commission, um, and we, you know, there was a lot of over and back. Um, the state aid process didn't open till the first of January. We were never going to have a, 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 a program in place, okay. you know, straight away anyway. I think, but I think. Things are changing. I think attitudes are changing in relation to forestry. I mean, I think we have to rebuild a culture of forestry here in Ireland. I think we've, we, we've never really had one. I mean, 100 years ago, we only had 1% of forestry. So we certainly haven't got a, a long culture of forestry yeah. here. It's about rebuilding that. But I think we will see that because we will have generational foresters now going through. We have yeah. plantations of 30, 40, 50 years now old. That will carry through, and I'd like to see that yeah. part of succession but programs. But the targets that we have, the 8,000 hectares a year, is that falling far short? I mean, the EPA is saying that we need between 13,000 and 40,000 hectares mm -hmm. to offset agricultural emissions by 2050. So is 8,000 really falling short of the mark? Well, 8,000 is our climate action plan target at the moment. I, I'd like to see us get to 8,000 and then evaluate if we can go further. I mean, we can set whatever target we want. We still need to engage particularly but would you agree that it's, it's not good enough well, to bring us to 2050? Pot potentially, potentially it's not. But um, we have to get moving, we have to get the trees in the ground and get that, that confidence in farmers, in the sector, to, to move on with that. Yeah. And I, I do believe it will come. Look, confidence is an issue that was dented as well as a result of ash dieback. And obviously that is a horrific disease that has affected plantations and farmers across the country. There is calls for a new compensation scheme. Minister, I think something you might agree has to be done for the farmers who are you know, impacted by ash dieback. The, the IFA, who aren't a million miles away from us here, their forestry committee chair, Jason Fleming, has called for a range of measures to, to help farmers who are impacted by that, including you know, roadside trees. There's, there's a whole suite of measures. But I think the main thing is a proper new compensation package. What do you have to say to that? Well, well certainly Jason and, and the IFA team will know full well that I, I um, commissioned an independent analysis, if you like, of the current um, ash dieback scheme. It, it was only put in place just before government was formed, so I think it was only right to give it some time to see its take up and its effectiveness. Um, I think it is clear that you know, it hasn't been effective at, at, at supporting farmers to do that. I mean, obviously, with rising costs, that's a challenge. And look, I, I, I'm, I'm fully, I have full sympathy with farmers who have planted ash, as the state asked them to and supported them to, um, you know, over the last couple of decades. Um, and, and it is quite depressing to stand in a field of dead ash. Yeah. Um, it really but, but is. But sympathy is one thing, no, Minister. I know, but that's the farmers the, want compensation. Well, absolutely. But again, the, the, the independent review, um, I'm hoping, will highlight some of those, some of the issues. I mean, again, we're constrained a little bit with state aid rules. Um, we can't just do what we want. We can't just pay what we would like to pay. Um, but I know that the, the, the group um, engage with all stakeholders. I'm sure they engage with the IFA and other forest owners, ash okay. owners. And I'm, you know, I'm going to sit down with them very soon and just tease out you know, what they found, what the recommendations are, and I would like to come up with some, some alternative uh, supports for the farmers, but I don't know what they'll look like yet. Will it be financial supports? Um, I'm sure there will have to be some support, but again, I'm not going to speak to any of the, the detail. Is I it too early know. to include that in the budget, or is this more of a European issue, do you feel? No, I think um, it might form part of it. I mean, we're right up against the, the you know, we're only a couple of weeks out from budget. It's and never we too late had, to ask, <laughs> Minister. It's never too late to ask, no, I agree. Um, but I think, um, I think we'll have to do something, because it is something we just... It, 
it's, it's, it, 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 we have to clear it. I think we need yeah. to be able to move on from Ash So, so would you be looking I to Michael McGrath to, to, to see if there is something available for those farmers? I, I'd certainly want to look to supports for the farmers in some way, but what okay. that looks like yet, I, I don't know. Okay, just one or two very quick points before we finish, Minister. Uh, you mentioned nitrates earlier on. Your party leader, Eamon Ryan, feels that not much is going to change now, given the fact that the European Commission have said that they're not really going to look at, at this issue again so soon, given the fact that our water quality uh, hasn't really improved. Is Commissioner Sinkovicius coming to Ireland a waste of time, do you feel? It, what, what do you make of that? I mean, uh, the Taoiseach has invited him over. Should this have happened months ago? And is there any point in it? Well, I think, I mean, yes, the Taoiseach has invited him. I know my colleague, Minister McConnell, who previously invited him. I think if, he, if, if, if Commissioner Sinkovicius were to come to Ireland, what we should be doing is reassuring him and the Commission that Ireland is serious about water quality, that we are going to double our efforts to improve the, the poor quality, the levels that we have that are below where we should be. Um, I mean, we get all this, oh, we're the second best water quality in, our, or in Europe, you know, so therefore what, we're fine, we're okay, well, well, we're not. We're benchmarked against ourselves, the trends are based on our own water quality. I think everyone accepts that. And I think the, the common ground here is everyone um, across society, farmers, you name it, wants better water quality. We have to have it, you know. We've seen the, 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 the I suppose, the catastrophe with Loch Ney in Northern Ireland at the moment. Yes. I mean, that, that water, that freshwater lake supplies like a quarter of the drinking water to Belfast, I think, it, or 40%, sorry, it's a yeah, significant amount. Yeah, it's a very amount. significant water supply, um, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's polluted yeah. now with nutrients yeah. from all sources. It's not always just farmers, and I, I, I accept, you know, people tend to point fingers, it's farmers, it's the local authorities. Yes. It's everyone's interest to get this right. And, uh, and beyond 2027, Minister, because we're tight on time, your gut feeling, what's in your heart? Is that 220 gone beyond 2025? Realistically, we are an outlier as things stand. And should we be looking at going down to 170? Do you I, think it's possible to I retain it? I think if it? we can turn the water quality around, it's under massive threat. I think everyone would agree with that. You know, we absolutely have to say, now it's going to be reassessed again at the end of 2025. So what have we got? A year, year and a half, two years max to yeah. try and show that we can do what we say. I think the, I, I have sympathy with the derogation farmers because the vast majority are doing exactly as they've been asked to do and the science says if you do a b and c then you will not leach nutrients from your farming system and so forth um, so it's it's all of agriculture's interest and society as i said to get the water quality right so i think we really need a doubling down and this is all about enforcement as well um, and we have now invested 60 million euro in a big water eip which is going to be working with farmers with dairy industry ireland with yeah. um, law pro the local authorities mm -hmm. so it would be nice to get that started as soon as possible and see if we can you know, affect change in our water quality over the next two years. That's what it'll come down to. OK, well, Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, Green Party Senator Pippa Hacker, thank you so much for joining thank us you. in the AgriLand Pavilion. Plenty more we could have discussed with the Minister. Time is against us. It's time to go back out onto site now and see what the AgriLand team have been getting up to.